Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Late last year I made a number of videos on a forgotten part of Giza, located to the southeast of the plateau which I believe holds the secrets of the first time, known as Zeptepi. I believe this area houses the primordial mound, the modern day Gebel Ghibli, the causeway to the underworld, the so called Wall of the Crow, and the entrance to the underworld, the House of Sokar, which is now under a modern day Coptic cemetery. I also believe the Sphinx has been in the landscape since time immemorial. The entrance into the underworld has been located thanks to the painstaking mathematical analysis of the Giza Plateau by author David Allen Ritchie, and in my opinion, he's right that all the evidence points to this location. We know there was work done on the Giza Plateau in the 4th dynasty by the pharaohs Khufu, Khafre and Menkore, and the landscape certainly held importance in the Old Kingdom, but what happened to this sacred ground? According to the Dream Stealer that sits between the paws of the Sphinx, in the 18th dynasty the Sphinx was buried in sand when Thutmose IV was still a young prince, which is strange if Giza was regarded to be a sacred landscape as we know it is. At some point in history, pre-1398 BC, the Dream Stealer implies that the Giza landscape was, to an extent, largely neglected. Why wasn't the majestic Sphinx on full display throughout history? When his father Amenhotep II was king of Egypt, Thutmose IV was not the crown prince, and it is believed that he ousted his older brother in order to usurp power and take the kingship for himself. The Dream Stealer and the Dream of Thutmose, which states that if he cleared away the sand from around the Sphinx he would become pharaoh, may well be royal propaganda. But historians are in no doubt that at the very least Thutmose IV did re-excavate and restore the Sphinx monument. Whatever the Sphinx originally was is open to debate, but the comparative study of the current Sphinx face and that of the mummy of Tutmos IV by Chuck on the CF app 7865 channel offers compelling evidence that the current form of the Sphinx is that of the 18th dynasty king. After my last video, I will also be doing a comparative study between the face of Ramesses the Great and the Sphinx, as this is another possible identity of the face of the monument due to the second stealer. We know that Thutmose IV constructed a wall around the Sphinx and its temples as a way to stop sand from recovering the ancient monument. He wanted it on show for all to see, with the centerpiece being the Dream Stealer to cement his kingship. But does the Dream Stealer give us any indication of what the Sphinx actually represents? Well, it says, Then the hour came to give rest to his followers at the limbs of Horamakhet beside Sokar. This clearly shows that in the times of Thutmose IV, the Sphinx was known as Horamakhet, which, unsurprisingly, the Dream Stealer says is beside Sokar. As I've already said, I believe this to be true, as we've located Sokar's realm to be in the Coptic Cemetery in Giza, which is pretty much beside the Sphinx. The god Horamakhet means Horus in the horizon, and he therefore represents the dawn or early morning sun. The next paragraph goes on to say, now then, the great statue of Kepri was lying in this place, great of power and powerful of majesty, the shadow of Ra resting upon it. The estates of the temple of Ptah in Memphis and all the neighbouring cities come to it, their arms raised in adoration before him, carrying many offerings for his car. It is important to note that Horemekat and Kepri, both of whom the Dream Stealer says the Sphinx identifies with, represented the morning or rising sun in the east, and they eventually became absorbed into one deity. The god that spoke to Tutmos in his dream identifies himself as Horemekat Kepri Atum. Kepri is the older god, and the earliest mentions of Kepri go back to Old Kingdom times, where a wish is expressed for the sun to come into being in the name of Kepri. It was Kepri who arose on the primeval mound. In the Book of the Dead, Acre, the lion god, gives birth to the god Kepri, the young, rising sun. A pair of Acre lions together was the symbol for the horizon, and the rising sun Kepri rises between the lions. Often though, Acre was just one recumbent lion. Some Egyptologists believe that the lion we see on the various First Dynasty labels, as discussed in one of my previous videos, is an early depiction of Acre, and I identified this lion on the labels to be a depiction of the Sphinx. Acre in its plural form is Akaru. The Akaru are very ancient, and according to Ancient Egypt Online, they are possibly even older than Geb. Acre protected the sun god, and bore the sun on his back through the underworld. The sun on the back of Acre also symbolised its rising. 
Also, Aker originally welcomed the dead pharaoh into the underworld. So, Kepri riding on the back of the Aker lion once symbolised the rising sun, and this was all encompassed in the god Horamaket, who in Egyptian art was often depicted as a sphinx, sometimes with the head of a man, a lion or a ram. The part of the name Aket is the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph that represents the rising sun over a mountain or horizon. This symbol was originally two acre lions back to back with the sun disc in the middle. Back to the Dream Stealer, and it is clear that the Sphinx was once a depiction of an acre lion, and I assume that originally there would have been some symbol of Kepri slotted in the hole in its back, which is probably why we see the Sphinx portrayed in Egyptian art with a blooming lotus flower on its back, which symbolised the sun and creation. After being an Aker lion with Kepri on its back, the Sphinx in its entirety became Horamaket, which makes sense as these gods did merge into one and they represent the same thing, as shown by the name of the god speaking to Tutmos in his dream, Horamaket Kepri Atum. As stated, he was a creator deity and represented the dawn and early morning sun on the horizon, and of course the Sphinx looks out directly due east where the sun rises. When the god is apparently talking to Tutmos, he identifies himself with the Sphinx, saying, The sands of the desert upon which I lie have reached me. This shows unequivocally that in the 18th dynasty, the Sphinx did represent Horamaket Kepri Atum. Interestingly, the Dream Stealer also infers that it was Khafre that made the Sphinx, as after this 4th dynasty king's name is mentioned, it says, The statue made for Atum Ra Horamaket. It infers that Khafre made the statue for the god. We can only use geological weathering to argue the point, but maybe Khafre did originally re-carve the head of the lion into his likeness. Maybe Tutmos or Ramesses the Great carved it again. We simply cannot know. To complicate matters a little more, the Steeler also says of Tutmos, May the good god live, the son of Atum, who protects Horakti, the living statue of the lord of all, the sovereign created by Ra, the excellent heir of Kepri, with a face as beautiful as that of his father, who came forth complete, equipped with his form of Horus upon him, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. Horakti is another god and means Horus of the Two Horizons, the god of the rising and setting suns, and he was a god who eventually went on to incorporate Horamaket Kepri. Horakti, Horamaket, and Kepri with Aker all represented the same thing, so the Dream Stealer is correct. Horakti was the heir of Kepri, who, as we found out, was the older deity. What we learn from the Dream Stealer is that, to the ancient Egyptians, the Sphinx is a manifestation of these deities, all of whom relate to one another and all are associated with the rising sun as it rises in the east from the underworld each day. This is as Tutmos IV records it in the 18th dynasty. Whether Tutmos' dream is real or not is not relevant for this video, as I am just trying to understand what the Sphinx was to the ancients. The Sphinx was originally an acre lion, which would have had some kind of giant lotus flower, or maybe a giant sun disc, on its back to represent Kepri. It then became Horamaket, and finally Horakti, all gods representing the same thing. But why is all this important? Well, in my last video, I discussed the belief that there was once an ancient sun cult at Giza, and now we know the likely original identity of the Sphinx, it explains why there was an ancient sun temple between its legs, as discussed in my previous video, and why the monument and the temple were painted red. This cult didn't literally worship the sun though, the morning sun simply symbolised the nature of what the cult believed was the one true god they were worshipping. I believe that the Giza cult was the original primordial religion of ancient Egypt, and the Great Sphinx was the centrepiece of this religion. I also believe that this is the same monotheistic religion that Akhenaten brought back, and interestingly, I'm not the first person to say this. Numerous 19th century Egyptologists state that in Egyptian history, the pantheon of gods are actually just expressions of the one true god. To give a couple of high profile examples, in 1855 the German Karl Lepsius said, I express the conviction that, for the first time, the Egyptians worshipped the one God, anonymous, incomprehensible, eternal in his purity. August Mariette said that in Egypt there existed one God, immortal, invisible and hidden, known only to the insiders of the sanctuary. The main Egyptian gods were simply personified aspects of the one true god, or local representatives in each district of the kingdom. 
Some speculate that only the priestly class and the monarchy knew this truth of Egyptian religion, and the pantheon of gods only existed to keep people in order. But, by all accounts, this knowledge was given too much power to the priests of Egypt, and because of this, the 18th dynasty saw drastic changes. Without doubt, the 18th dynasty is the most turbulent era of ancient Egyptian history, thanks to the infamous pharaoh Akhenaten, who single-handedly changed the state religion of Egypt, removing the pantheon of gods in favour of the Aten. Tutmos IV was his grandfather. A variety of researchers, including author David Allen Ritchie, speculate that Tutmos IV was actually the king who began Artanism, and put the wheels in motion for a change that his grandson Akhenaten would eventually fulfil. The principles of the new religion are the monotheistic belief in the one true god that was represented by the disk of the sun. But make no mistake, Akhenaten didn't worship the sun disk because Artanism wasn't sun worship. Artanism was related to the idea of creation and continued existence providing life and energy. The Artanism god wasn't the sun disk, he was simply represented by it, being the best way to represent the ultimate source of all life that Artanism was all about. Akhenaten made it very clear that the Artan only represented the god, but the god actually transcended creation and so could not be fully understood, represented or portrayed. I believe that Akhenaten was the first public monotheist in history, before anybody in the Old Testament. Either that, or he was Moses himself. The new god was worshipped in the open sunlight, and not in the dark temple enclosures of old, but only Akhenaten and his family could connect with the god. This, in effect, ended the power of the priestly class. In a hymn to the Aten, Akhenaten states, There is none who knows thee, save thy son, Akhenaten. Maybe this is why the new religion was so unpopular with the masses. So, how does this all relate back to the Sphinx and Tutmos IV? Well, during his reign, Horomaket or Horakti, the god represented by the Sphinx, who was responsible for the king's divine claim, for the first time gained prominence over the most powerful god, Amun-Ra. This was likely politically motivated to stop the growing power of the Amun priestly class in Egypt. The pharaoh directly identified himself with the main god Ra, and he certainly marked the beginning of the religious revolution of Egypt. His son Amenhotep III called himself the Dazzling Sun, and we all know how far his grandson Akhenaten took this new religion. On the numerous stelas that were placed to mark the boundaries of Akhenaten's new capital of Akhetaten, the god's full name was displayed. It was, long live Ra Harakte, he who rejoices in the horizon in his name, as the sunlight which is Aten. In time, it was shortened to just the Aten. To me, this denotes that Ra Harakte, which the Sphinx represents, and the Aten are one and the same, or one is an element of the other. It eventually just became the Aten to remove all references to the old gods that came before, to cement the new Artanism religion. As the Dream Stealer states, the Sphinx was Harakti, the living statue of the Lord of All, the Sovereign, created by Ra, the excellent heir to Kepri. Although this is rarely recorded, due to the original name of the Artanism god, the Sphinx was obviously a strong symbol for the new religion, and this is seen in the art of Akhenaten, where he depicts himself as the Sphinx on a number of occasions. Akhenaten banished all forms of idolatry across Egypt, all except for the Sphinx, which remained prominent and was still used artistically. This is because the Sphinx was a symbol of the monotheistic religion of the ancients, which had finally been brought back to the masses via Artanism. Looking at all of this in more detail, I would also suggest that Akhenaten introduced the original concept of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Akhenaten's religion, this was Ra Harakte as the father, Aten was the Holy Spirit, the physical expression of the father visible to humanity, and the pharaoh was the son of Ra Harakte and Aten, their manifestation on earth. Ra and Horus combined were Ra Harakte. He was the patron of the pharaoh and the noble classes, and was apparently the most popular form of Ra after the Middle Kingdom. He created the world, and the rising sun was, for them, a symbol of creation. He was the master of life. Archonarton did eventually lose the Heracti part of the full Arton title, and before becoming just the Arton, the god's name was Long Live Ra, ruler of the two horizons, he who rejoices in the horizon, in his name as Ra, the father who returns as Arton. 
For the Sphinx to be a statue of Ra Harakti makes sense as it looks out from the Giza Plateau to the rising sun. In the 18th dynasty he was the most important god in Egypt. He was more than just a solar deity, he was Ra and Horus combined, riding on the back of the powerful guarding Acre Lion. Ra Harakti became Akhenaten's father, the one true god who was also portrayed as a sun disc with wings. It is no coincidence that we see this sun disc with wings in Mesopotamian art, where we also find Sphinx statues with wings as well. This is all one religion, and the pantheon of gods were merely to keep the masses in check. I believe that Tutmos IV, Amenhotep III and Akhenaten were trying to restore the original religion of Egypt from the first time, and I believe the excavation of the Sphinx in the 18th dynasty put the wheels in motion. Did Tutmos discover the truth, and did he learn the secrets of the first time? As well as being associated with the rising sun, which represented Akhenaten's one true god, Acre Lions guarded the realm of Sokar, known as Rostau. And Rostau, which is called the land of Sokar, who is upon the sand, was at Giza. Specifically, the land around and containing the primordial mound of Gebel Ghibli, next to where there is a large statue of a lion, the Sphinx. Tutmos IV re-excavated the Sphinx, which represents the father god of Akhenaten's religion, and it is no surprise that Akhenaten portrayed himself as the Sphinx as well. He portrayed himself as the son of god, and making himself a Sphinx was a way to show this artistically. The Great Sphinx was clearly a very significant monument for the 18th dynasty family. Akhenaten's son, the legendary Tutankhamun, even built a villa at Giza next to the Sphinx. What this study shows is that I believe that Giza is a sacred landscape from the first time, with a primordial mound, Sokar's realm, and a representation of the one true father god from the first time, the Sphinx, which would have been adorned by a giant solar disc or lotus fan. I believe that Tutmos IV discovered the keys to unlock the sacred knowledge of the Elders, after removing the sand from around the Sphinx. He and his family wanted to remove the power of the priestly class, restore Egypt to how it once was in the first time, also known as Zeptepi, and remove the pantheon of false gods. Tutmos and Amenhotep III made subtle changes, and moved slowly, as you cannot change a state religion overnight. But why Akhenaten failed was simply because he tried to make too many changes in a generation. He did too much too quickly. But Tutmos, Amenhotep and Akhenaten were not the first pharaohs to try and make the change. In fact, I believe that Khufu of the 4th dynasty also attempted this. It is no surprise that he is the man attributed to building the Great Pyramid. He certainly worked on, restored or changed the pyramid in ways we can only speculate, but it is also the other details of his reign that we should take note of. According to Herodotus, like Akhenaten, Khufu shut down all of the temples in Egypt, and prevented the priests from conducting customary sacrifices. There are also no reliefs or carvings that show the king making an offering to an Egyptian god, which is unheard of. He apparently spent his time renovating the sacred landscape at Giza, including expanding the underground chambers beneath the plateau where he wished to be buried. Much like Akhenaten, he was remembered for being a heretic and an evil and wicked pharaoh, but was that simply because he was just like Akhenaten, trying to change too much too quickly and employing the Egyptian workforce to do things they did not understand and therefore did not wish to do? The two known occasions when a pharaoh gave the Giza Plateau extra special attention, they ended up trying to make large-scale changes across Egypt that ultimately failed. I believe that Khufu and then Tutmos found the so-called Hall of Records, also known as the House of Sokar. They found the knowledge of the ancients from Zeptepi, and they respected it and concealed it by renovating the Giza Plateau. The meaning of the name Tutmos is Thoth is born, and the message on the Dream Stealer explains why he became Pharaoh and not his older brother, the Crown Prince. It says that in his dream the Sphinx told him to clear away the sand and he would become the next Pharaoh. But as most take this as meaning something supernatural took place to make him Pharaoh, I think that the actual act of removing the sand is what guaranteed him the throne. I think that what Tutmos is actually telling us here is that there is something sacred under the Sphinx. I don't think it is the Hall of Records or House of Sokar, as I believe that is under the Coptic Cemetery. But I think the doorway under the Sphinx, as seen in the art of Tutmos, Ramesses and Akhenaten, as well as spoken about by 19th century explorers, is the key to unlocking the Giza Plateau. The key to gain access to the Hall of Records and the sacred knowledge of the first time. We know it's down there, we now need to go in. 
I have speculated in the past that the Sphinx represented the gods Anubis, Happy and Neith. But I now think in early dynastic times it must portray the Acre Lion in its solitary recumbent form as was seen so often in First Dynasty Egyptian art. With the sun disc on its back it represented the rising sun Kepri before becoming Horamaket or Horus in the horizon before its final incarnation as Ra Harakti. I believe the Sphinx was a representation of the original father god of ancient Egypt also displayed as a winged disc as seen in both Egypt and Mesopotamia and venerated so blatantly in the 18th dynasty by Akhenaten. I have just launched a second YouTube channel called Space and Planets which focuses on Earth and space science news as well as independent scientific research. Please subscribe now to give my new channel a head start, there is a link in the description below. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects, if you enjoyed the video please subscribe to the channel, please like the video and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.